Hello and welcome back to another episode in the Introduction to Windows Forensics series. In this video, we're going to take a look at triage image creation and exactly what data you should grab from a system so that you can quickly begin your forensic investigation. Now I do realize that this is a more basic video than some of the others in this series, but it is something that has been frequently requested and I think it'll be beneficial to many people. We're going to be using FTK Imager because it's my tool of choice, and you can see that I do have the product download page for that pulled up here. I'll include a link to this in the description below. This is a free utility from Access Data that provides a way to capture volatile data, i.e. memory, and non-volatile data with ease. We'll see how we can leverage the ability to create custom content images to grab a subset of the data from a drive that will most likely contain the evidence that you're seeking. As a side note, I'm going to assume you're already familiar with the artifacts that we're going to be obtaining, but if you aren't, I would invite you to check out the Introduction to Windows Forensics playlist. I'll leave a link in the description below. Nearly everything you'll see in the next section of the video is covered there, but I'll briefly explain what each item is as we add it to the custom content image. So in the next section of the video, We'll fire up FTK Imager and get started. As you can see, we're going to be using FTK Imager version 4.2.0.13, which as of the recording of this video is the newest available release. That said, the interface for FTK Imager has not changed by any significant amount in years, so even if you're using an older version, you should be able to follow along with this video. Let me first stress the importance of always obtaining volatile data, our memory, first. So do not go to a computer system and create a custom content image or image the drive and then obtain memory, because by doing so, you are actually changing the contents of memory by a significant measure. So always grab memory first. Across the top, you'll actually notice a toolbar icon that's in the shape of a little stick of RAM. If we click that, that is our memory capture dialog. The first option is destination path. Here we would want to save, of course, the memory image to an external drive, such as an external USB flash drive or hard drive that we would connect to the target system for the purposes of obtaining forensic evidence. Now, one question that often comes up is, aren't you changing evidence on the computer system by connecting a peripheral to it? Well, absolutely, yes, but unless we have something like F-Response at our disposal that would enable us to remotely acquire memory and data from the hard drive, we don't really have much of a choice. Like everything else in information security, the most important advice I can give you is to document, document, document. So for example, you might state that examiner Jane Doe connected USB flash drive, make and model blah, serial number blah, at 11.53 a.m. on 1 August 2018 to Computer System X for the purposes of capturing memory and creating a custom content image, something to that effect. So always document exactly what you are doing. Now, we would obviously want to save this to that external media, but for the demo, I'm simply going to save it to the desktop. Do not do that on an actual computer system from which you want to obtain real forensic evidence you would always save it to an external device. We'll keep the file name as memdump.mem. We're actually going to grab the page file as part of the custom content image, so I'm going to leave that unchecked, and we'll also skip creation of the AD1 file and simply create a raw memory file instead. I'll click Capture Memory, and you'll notice that I have a previous one. I'll go ahead and overwrite memdump.mem. This virtual machine is approximately 8 gigs of RAM allocated to it, and as you can see, it's dumping it fairly quickly. We'll next move over to the actual creation of the custom content image so that we can grab some of the artifacts on disk. So let's take a look at that next. Okay, now we need to go ahead and attach the actual hard drive so that we can grab disk-based evidence. So I'll click on File and Add Evidence Item. You'll notice this icon, which is also available on the toolbar. And we'll leave it at Physical Drive. And here you'll notice the actual Physical Drive 0, which is our VMware Virtual Disk. 
In fact, that's the only thing in the dropdown in this case. I'll click Finish, and let's go ahead and expand this evidence tree. It's partition two that we'll be interested in, and as we drill down into this NTFS partition, under root, you'll notice the root of the file system. So if I click here, you'll see the files in the root of this NTFS volume. So now let's start building our custom content image. First thing we're going to do is start off with some NTFS metadata files. In fact, we're going to grab the $extend folder. We'll right click on it and then click add to custom content image. Within $extend, we have a directory that contains information regarding NTFS features such as reparse points, disk quotas, and other NTFS metadata files. You'll find, as you can see here, OBJ ID, quota, reparse, and USN journal, JRNL. So now that we've added that to the custom content image, let's grab dollar recycle bin. We'll right click and also choose add to custom content image. Now, of course, dollar recycle bin will contain a series of subdirectories, which are the SIDs for each user on the system, and that represents each user's recycle bin. So if a user placed something in the recycle bin and they have not yet emptied that recycle bin, there may be evidence there that we would want to obtain. So we'll go ahead and add dollar recycle bin. And as you can see, it is listed here. If we move this over, you can see extend and recycle bin are the two things in our custom content sources thus far. Next, let's grab our entire user's directory. We'll right click and then do add to custom content image. Now it should come as no surprise that almost all user centric files, pictures, movies, and cache and things that we'll be interested in are going to be located somewhere within the user's user profile. So by obtaining the entire user's directory from the hard drive, we've got a good chance at finding the data that we're after. So we'll go ahead and grab that. Next, let's go back to the root and let's grab $log file, which is another NTFS artifact. This is the file system transaction journal, and in short, it records all transactional data relating to file system activity. Then that's recorded prior to the activity actually happening, because if the system were to crash, this would ensure that it, incomplete transactions could be covered by rolling them back or completing them once the system comes back online. So again, this is an important a forensic artifact, or at least it can be in some cases. So let's go ahead and add that. The next thing we'll add is $MFT, which you're probably familiar with. $MFT is arguably one of the most critical files in the entire NTFS file system. It is the master file table, which is basically a database that contains information about every file and directory on the system, including their names, their MACB timestamps, which as a reminder, that means modified, accessed, MFT record changed, and birth, their permissions, and much more. In fact, each MFT entry is comprised of numerous attributes, some of which we've talked about in previous videos, such as dollar standard underscore information and dollar file underscore name. I would highly encourage you to check out the other videos in this series if you're not familiar with this. So we've got MFT added here, as you can see. Next, we've got three files that we'll typically grab from the root, and that would be hyperfile.sys, which is not present in this case, pagefile.sys, and swapfile.sys. The hyperfile is often found on laptops, and it supports, of course, hibernation when the system would suspend when it's critically low on battery, for example. That actually will contain an entire copy of RAM in the Hyber file, and it's extremely important forensically. So you might find, for example, an old Hyber file on a system that could contain data that's been long since gone or paged out of actual memory. So it will be very important to grab the Hyber file. Also, that supports things like Windows 10 Fast Boot, so you'll often see that. And then of course our paging and swapping files are here. So let's go ahead and add page file and swap file.sys to the custom content image. Next, we've got a folder underneath program data that's going to be very important. So back in the Windows XP days, you're probably familiar with documents and settings all users. Well, now it's program data, which is basically our all users 
uh, related information will be stored here. So underneath that, underneath Microsoft, and then underneath search data, and then applications and windows finally, we've got a file that will be called windows.edb, which is an ESC database, extensible storage engine database, that pertains to Windows search. So this is going to be very important because any Windows related search history can be parsed by looking at this particular database. So there's all sorts of interesting evidence there. So let's go ahead and add that to the custom content image. Next, let's go ahead and look at our Windows directory. And of course, it should come as no surprise that there are plenty of things under the Windows directory that we'll want to grab. Starting with App Compat, which is here, and Programs. Underneath here, we have a registry hive called amcache.hve. Amcache is one of several artifacts that can help us show evidence of program execution. And it's a very important artifact on a system. So let's go ahead and grab that entire tree there, Programs. Next, let's grab setupapi.dev.log, which is located in the INF directory. So this file is a log file that will record basically any kind of peripheral installation, things like if we insert a USB flash drive, for example, not only will there be evidence of that in the registry, but also within the setupapi.dev.log. So as we scroll through here, we'll actually see that file right here and we'll right click on it and choose add to custom content image. Now let's grab our registry hives. So registry hives on Windows are going to be located in system root, which of course is typically C colon backslash Windows, underneath the system32 directory, and then underneath our config directory. So here's config. Now there are five registry hives that we're going to primarily obtain, and those are, in order, default, SAM, security, software, and system. These are our main registry hives. Now, if we scroll up to the top, you'll also notice a directory called regback. Within that, you'll actually see those same hives. So there's actually a process called regidle process or regidle backup that every 10 days will actually create a backup of the registry hives. So it's important in case the registry hives have been deleted or somehow modified or changed, we would want to grab regback because some data that may no longer be present in the registry may be available there. So let's go ahead and add the entire regback directory to the custom content image. And as you can see, it is listed right here. So next, let's grab a directory called log files, which is also going to be present under system 32. Now, while our main Windows log files that you're used to looking at in Windows Event Viewer are not going to be located in that location, there are quite a few other log files that will be located uh, within the log files directory. So again, I'm under System32, and we'll scroll down until we find that log files directory. And as you can see, it is right here. So let's add that to the custom content image. Next, let's grab the SRU directory. If you've previously watched the video covering SRUM, the System Resource Utilization Monitor, you will remember how important that particular artifact was. In fact, we can use a utility called SRUM Dump that will actually parse this particular artifact. And there is a huge amount of information within SRUM. We can find things like the number of bytes transferred and SSIDs connected to and even energy related settings and all sorts of useful information about a computer. So we'll definitely want to grab SRUM. I'll just go ahead and add the entire SRU directory to the custom content image. Now you're probably familiar with ntuser.dat, which is every user's personal registry hive. So in other words, every user on the system will have their own ntuser.dat, which contains the registry pertaining to that particular user. So instead of parsing all the users and adding each user's ntuser.dat, we can simply click new here. You'll notice an asterisk 
we'll edit that and just change it to ntuser.dat. It should all be uppercase, but we'll go ahead and choose ignore case anyway, and then match all occurrences, include subdirectories as selected by default. This will now grab all ntuser.dat files across the file system. So let's grab that. But there's also another registry hive that's user specific that you may not be as familiar with, and it's called usrclass.dat. So each user will have this as well. One of the most important artifacts we'll find there is shell bags, which again, there's a video covering that if you're not familiar with shell bags. This was actually put in place though to facilitate user account control in Windows Vista and later. So we'll definitely want to grab usrclass.dat. Okay, next up, let's grab those other Windows EVTX event logs. So I'm gonna edit this and change it to EVTX. And again, the previous version was EVT, but newer log files in Windows are all EVTX files. So when you think of the security log and the system log files, those are EVTX files. So let's go ahead and grab all the EVTX files across the file system and we'll match all occurrences here. Now let's grab our link files. LNK or link files are very rich with tons of data. If you're not familiar with that, I would encourage you to research link files because it's amazing the amount of data we can glean from parsing them. So we'll definitely want to grab all of those present on the system. Let's also grab our PF files. PF is prefetch. Prefetch is another artifact that can show us evidence of program execution, much like AM cache could. So definitely want to grab PF. And then let's wrap it up by grabbing something called $i30. You may have noticed a $i30 file present in the root directory. In fact, every directory on the file system will have a $i30 file. And this is basically a directory index. So the file maintains a list of all of the files and directories that belong within a given directory. And you'll also hear it referred to as the index attribute. We can use this as a means of identifying files that were previously deleted or overwritten. So again, it's $i30. And we'll go ahead and grab those as well. So you can see from top to bottom, starting with extend, which is a directory containing some NTFS metadata files and ending with $i30, we have now created our custom content image sources. Now we actually need to create the image itself. So let's click the Create Image button at the bottom, and you'll notice there is an Image Destination section. Obviously, we would not want to save it to the local machine's hard drive, but in this case, because it's a demo, that's exactly what I'm going to do. We could fill out, of course, the metadata here, case number, evidence number, et cetera. I would highly recommend you fill that out in a real case. For the destination, I'm again going to choose desktop, but again, don't do this on a real system. And for our image file name, we'll just call this testing. By default, you'll notice that it will fragment every 1.5 gig or 1500 meg, which is fine. And the compression is set to six by default. I don't want to necessarily encrypt anything or filter data by file owner, so I'm going to leave those unchecked and simply click Finish. You'll notice here that we have the destination for the image now populated. Verify images after they are created is checked, which I would highly recommend doing. We can also check this option, which will create directory listings of all the files within our custom content image after it's created, which I would recommend doing. It's not necessary to pre-calculate the progress statistics, so I'll go ahead and leave that unchecked and click Start. And as you can see, we're off to the races. We are now creating our custom content image. And of course, depending on the amount of data on the system, this could take anywhere from a few minutes to several hours. But regardless, this will be much, much faster than imaging potentially multiple terabytes which you sometimes encounter in the field. It's certainly not uncommon to encounter desktops with one terabyte or two terabyte hard drives. So instead of sitting there and waiting for that to image, we can very quickly grab the data that is most likely to obtain the evidence that we're after. And that is the entire purpose of creating a triage image. 
So to recap, we have first captured memory, always, always, always capture memory first. Now we are creating our custom content image. We could then grab this flash drive or USB hard drive, run back to our lab, and immediately start analyzing some data. And then of course, at this point, we could actually take the computer system, power it off, remove the drive, connect it to a write blocker, and create a forensic image of the entire drive if that was necessary. So that's pretty much everything I wanted to show you in this video. I am not by any means saying that this is the only data you should grab, but by and large, this is what my team often grabs when we go into the field to image a computer system. This contains a wealth of data. And again, by grabbing that entire user's tree, which is arguably one of the most important things we added to the custom content image, this is where most of our user specific data, including browser history and cache and cookies and various other things are going to be found. So we got all of that in addition to various other files that can show us evidence of program execution and various other things. So I hope this video has been informative and helpful. Again, I realize that it's a little more basic than some of the other videos in this series, but it does cover an important concept. And if you're new to forensics, this is probably going to be beneficial to you. If you have any comments or suggestions about this video or future videos, I would highly encourage you to send them to me. And as always, thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch this video. Please do like, subscribe, and share, and I'll catch you in the next one.